So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and um, I have the honor and privilege of introducing Dr. Daniel Santisteban, who's a clinical psychologist and received his training at Rutgers University um, and University of Miami, his PhD and Bellevue Hospital NYU um, for internship. He is the co-founder and director of research for training and implementation associates international and a professor emeritus at the University of Miami School of Education and Human Development. Dr. Sati Steban's research has focused on adolescent and family therapy, culturally informed treatment and family therapy training and implementation. He is a developer of an adaptive evidence-based family therapy called Culturally Informed and Flexible Family Treatment for Adolescents, um, short SIFTA. We are so excited by the way, and we are gonna be getting some of my, us, myself and colleagues here at DSFG will be uh, have the privilege um, of uh, learning um, to implement SIFTA. Um, and it is one of the few evidence-based treatments originally designed for Latino families and is being utilized in community agencies around the country. Dr. Sati Esteban has a long history of NIH, SAMHSA, and foundation grants. These grants have led to the development of testing of evidence-based treatments for Latinos, the training for over a thousand students and community service providers. His current work is funded by the National Institute on Mental Health and focuses on creating evidence-based platforms for training, coaching, and implementation support. And sustainability, I'd like to add. Um, Santi Esteban has published extensively in the areas of family therapy outcomes, substance use, and co-occurring disorders, technology-assisted treatment, and culturally informed treatment. He is currently working on a book on family therapy for Latino adolescents, which I will buy and have you sign it. Um, awards received include the 2004 American Family Therapy Academy. I know you said I shouldn't, I didn't have to read this entire bio, but I want to anyway. Okay. I'm just happy I sold one book. <laughs> Um, so you, um, awards include 2004 American Family Therapy Academy Award for Distinguished Contribution to Family Systems Research, the 2012 University of Miami Civic Engagement Award, the 2020 University of Miami Provost Award, the 2020 American Psychological Association's Division 45 Psychological Study of Culture, Ethnic, and Race Award for Distinguished Career in Research, and the 2020 National Hispanic Science Network Award for Excellence in Research by a Senior Investigator. So we're really lucky. I'm really excited. Um, I'm going to be quiet so we can hear from you and learn from you. Passing the mic off to you. Thank you so much. Uh, um, it's such a pleasure to be here with you. I admire the work that you all do. Uh, and we certainly appreciate everything that you do. I see some familiar names from my clinical trials network days. Um, and um, so let me see if I can get this started here. Hopefully you can see my screen. Yes. So we are going to be talking about uh, SIFTA uh, and a culturally informed treatment for adolescents. And uh, if all goes well, today, we will be talking. Let me just make sure this is working OK here. Yeah, if all goes well, we will be talking uh, about some of the outcomes for the research that we've done on SIFTA. We will um, hope that you understand some of the specific ways in which you can treat adolescents and families on a number of presenting symptoms and important to us, not only reducing symptoms, but improving family function, which is a really important piece for us. We think of not only risk factors, but protective factors, as, as you will see in a little bit. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the newest phase of our research and, and work, which is on innovation around training, implementation, and sustainability. And I'm gonna mention a little later that, you know, for the first part of my career, before the, all the gray hairs, I thought that the most important thing was to develop an evidence-based treatment. And, and then I realized that that doesn't mean that it's gonna be used and sustainable. And so more recently, we realized that we have to have an evidence-based, um, an evidence-based approach to uh, training and implementation right? Just as we have an evidence-based approach to treatment. And we've been really, really fortunate to, to be funded by the National Institute of Mental Health to address just that, both in development and in terms of research. So I think I'm probably preaching to the choir in this, in this sense that, you know, that the best way to improve services, one of the good ways to improve services is to look to evidence-based treatments and the tools that they have. And uh, there are a lot of advantages, right? 
um, having evidence for the effectiveness, efficacy and effectiveness, having detailed training and the uh, de treatment delivery protocols, right, and manuals, uh, hopefully with some tools that really help the implementation. Uh, an articulation of how change happens, right? I think that really helps the mission uh, to understand what we're shooting for, right, as intermediate changes. And then, um, and then relevant to all of your work, uh, when adaptations are needed, right, to an intervention to make it particularly useful and effective with recent immigrants, with Latino populations, et cetera. So those are some of the real clear advantages. Now, some of the work that drove my particular research is that I felt that evidence-based treatments have not always been great at um, talking about the unique stressors and circumstances, right, of diverse populations. Um, and for us, very important things like immigration processes, acculturation processes, the stress that comes with some of those, right, racism, marginalization, right? We'll be talking a little bit about our work with LGBTQ youth and, and how, you know, important it is to understand the specifics, right, of what the kids are going through and also the family dynamics, right, with those kids and rejection and acceptance, et cetera. So we thought, you know, it's really important that it, we don't pick one or the other, either an evidence-based treatment or one that's culturally informed. And unfortunately, I did feel that a lot of the evidence-based treatments have focused so much on the generic processes of treatment, which is really important, but not talking about cultural and diversity and how those interact, right? And to the extent that we think we've been somewhat successful, it's because we've tried to become very specific about what that interaction is, right, between mechanisms and processes and cultural variables. And hopefully I can give you a, a few of those examples today. Our, our goal obviously is to create something with ecological validity, which is something that many folks have talked about, including uh, Bernal and, and his team. Ecological validity is very important that, that if someone hears me as a therapist working with a family, that they hear me talking about things like acculturation, racism, et cetera, that is built into the therapy. Uh, these tensions have been described pretty nicely in this in, in this one uh, uh, monograph um, on bridging culture and evidence. I was happy to see that 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 was uh, available. So let me see. I don't see my poll available here. Oh, there it is. Are you all able to see a poll open? Yeah, Wonderful. we have it. Wonderful. Should we go ahead and fill it out? Please, please. And it's all that apply. And really, I just want to get a feel for your perspective, right, on some of the issues that I just talked about. Um, whether manuals are considered to be rigid and restrictive, um, whether evidence-based treatments are effective, do they deal with race, ethnicity, um, are they difficult to learn and implement? To what extent are manuals are helpful? And then issue of sustainability, right? To what extent is that one of the big challenges that you see? And remember, it's all that apply. So you can have a positive and a concern or challenge around it. So things appear to be slowing down. So we have um, so we have um, forty seven percent saying uh, manuals tend to be restrictive and rigid. Thirty two percent effective that they are effective. Uh, Seventy nine percent they don't deal well with issues of race ethnicity. Uh, Six percent they are difficult to learn and implement. That's a good thing. Uh, manuals are helpful in implementation, 50%, and difficult to sustain in practice, 53%. Okay, the big one is uh, that evidence-based practices don't often do not deal well with issues of ethnicity, race, uh, et cetera.
Anybody surprised? A raise, uh, a raise of hand. Anybody surprised by these results? I can't see all your hands, but um, so so this is an this is a, a an important set of issues, and and um, uh, I want to talk to you today about the get rid of this. I want to talk to you today about culturally informed uh, treatment and how it attempted to deal with some of these issues. So this is just a quick graphic on uh, our last 20 years of history on this. Uh, you know, we worked hard to understand some of the symptomatology that were most prominent and most often seen in, in Latinx uh, youth. We moved to that second um, sphere here that is, you know, understanding what is behind that symptomatology from the perspective of family processes and cultural processes, right? Um, then we went ahead and worked to develop this culturally informed treatment and to test it with um, primarily with uh, National Institute on Drug Abuse and National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparity uh, funding. And then, as I mentioned, we moved to this last phase, which is uh, with NIMH working on this issue of innovative online training and implementation. This is our whole history. That's where all the gray hairs came from. <laughs> Research and, 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 and sharing of information on all of those things. Um, our culturally informed, flexible, family-based treatment for adolescents. Its weakness is I couldn't get a shorter name. <laughs> so I do depend on SIFTA, but I wanted to talk about, I, I didn't want to forget that we are trying to be culturally informed. We need to be flexible and we need to be family-based. So this is what family-based means to us, right? That we have a focus on risk and protective fam uh, factors at the family level, yeah? And that we help therapists understand how to identify and modify, right? Risk factors and identify and enhance protective factors. Very important to us that this piece uh, be in place. Although you will see that we have a very strong adolescent therapy component to our therapy, right? But we really, it's basis family work. Um, we think that one of the important things is that as adolescents change, uh, families need to see and reinforce those changes. Sometimes adolescents begin to change, the family has not, and the family works against, right? The changes that the adolescent is making. And so, the reason to have this together is so that that does not happen. And also that the family um, begin to see, right, some of the adolescent struggles that are behind perhaps substance use and, um, and acting out behavior, right? When some of those behaviors become very intense, it may be difficult to see the struggles with depression, right, with marginalization that the adolescents are going through. Um, and finally, and especially important when our kids and families are working, are, are living in high risk environments, neighborhoods uh, uh, with messages that work against the well being of the kids, that the families need to be advocates, right, for the youth in the school system, in the health system, um, in, in, uh, in uh, high risk neighborhoods, that they can develop uh, ways of working as a family that can buffer, right, uh, against some of the um, high-risk factors. What does culturally informed mean to us, right? It, and it's that we, we address these things that we're talking about and have material on unique stressors, discrimination, acculturation, that we're talking about stigma and, and culture-related beliefs that might get in the way of some of the processes that we wish to uh, see in the family, that we not miss strengths like familism, right? Uh, and that we think always about how cultural factors are interacting with things like engagement of reluctant family members, uh, processes like therapeutic alliance, and outcomes, yeah? Then the third piece of this is the flexibility piece, right? And um, you know, I, I worked with manualized therapies for a very long time. 
Um, and I always was concerned that we still went about it with an approach of one size fits all. And I really wanted to work on something that allowed the clinician that was implementing the intervention to integrate what they were seeing, their clinical knowledge with the selection of certain parts, right, of the model so that it can become a lot more flexible. Yeah. So the flexibility that I'll be talking about is around tailoring on clinical symptomatology, on cultural uniqueness, and as well as on particular stressors that are impinging on, on the adolescent and family's life. Now, now, the issue of flexibility is a great one, unless it's not replicable, right? Because the, what happens is that if you want to have an evidence-based intervention that's flexible, you have to have some decision rules that allow it to be replicable, that I might do it the same way you do it, that I make the decisions in a similar way. So we'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. I want to say a little bit about the issue of uh, flexibility and culture. So, you know, this is what we might see, right? We might see an adolescent. Uh, they might come in with self-harm, depression, substance use. We actually have had studies on each of these. We have a self-harm study ongoing right now, just about finishing. We've worked on a substance use specifically. Uh, we always look at family conflicts. We often have kids uh, uh, referred by the juvenile justice system. But having a broader frame means that we want to look at some of these things, right? What is the role of anti-Latinx sentiment, racism, um, under-resourced communities? How do we build? How do we build in a systematic way of addressing these in order to, right, provide treatment for things like self-harm? Um, and and it really comes to you know reducing risk factors, but also working on protective factors. Yeah. So I always want to remember this because sometimes you know risk and protection are seen sort of as the same uh, coin, the two sides. You know, some people will say, well, if the family is doing well, it's protective, and if they're doing poorly, it's risk. But I also want you to think about these as two separate and potentially coexisting things, right? When we think we're, you know, we're big on hurricanes here in Florida and the risk is a hurricane and we know the damage that that could, you know, theoretically bring about. And so shutters for us are a way of protection and we, and we can reduce the damage of the risk factor by uh, triggering our protective factor. If you're football fans, you know that if the helmets weren't on, right, uh, you're going to get a lot of damage because head-to-head -head collisions will create major damage. The use of helmets is a way to simultaneously create protection, uh, not perfectly, as we know, but to some extent, it, you know, so thinking, thinking this through means that even when there are risk factors, right, that are adverse conditions that are likely to cause uh, damage, right, to our clients, we may still, even when we cannot change those risk factors, uh, look to see what specific protective factors we can trigger to ameliorate, right, the, the, uh, the ultimate harm. Really important. And really important because when, when I was doing primarily clinical work, I could easily become hopeless right, hopeless that I could not change some of the risk factors. But if I could begin to understand ways of triggering protective factors, resilience in kids and families, I can become more hopeful. And if I, and if I as a therapist can become more hopeful, maybe the family can become more hopeful, yeah? So again, and I just wanna say again that, that you know, um, I think the trick to having evidence-based and culturally informed treatments is to be really thoughtful about both mechanisms and processes and specifically how do cultural processes interact there, right? So engagement is a really big deal. You can't really do family therapy if you don't have specialized interventions for engaging reluctant family members, right? 
in the second in the second phase here, uh, retention is going to depend on how good your therapeutic alliance is, right? And so, in my in my book, a therapy should be talking about okay, how do cultural factors impact these things? Yeah, and so let's talk about engagement just for a second. If you're working with Latino, Haitian, as we are working with here in Miami, with Asian populations that are recent immigrants, you must be trained, comfortable, and well-informed on how to talk about the immigration experience in a way that is engaging and that is validated, right? If you are unprepared to do that, if you're just collecting information as if it's a bureaucratic piece of work to fill out a form, you're probably losing the family. But if you're talking with interest and exploring and, and, and validating, right, the difficulties, the loss, the, 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 um, the family disruptions that occur because of immigration, uh, if you can talk uh, smartly about acculturation stress, well, now you're, now you're having a conversation right from day one, from minute one, that's engaging and that's validating. And that, t and that tells the family, this therapist, this agency gets it, right? They understand me and what I'm going through. And I am more hopeful that th that treatment can be successful. The same with Therapeutic Alliance. If we have in our mind a way of something that we're trying to accomplish with therapy, and the family is not on board with that, well, they're not on the same page about goals for the therapy or the interventions. And so the extent to which we can have that discussion openly and how cultural worldviews might impact, right, the view of therapy, well, now all of a sudden we're going to be much more successful, I think. So this, so this graphic is just a reminder to me that to be successful, our, our, our knowledge of cultural factors has to be linking, right? with the things we're trying to get done in therapy. I figured I'd give you just a couple of examples, some of which you may know very well, but for example, we in family work want to increase, improve relationships in families. But we know that kids and parents acculturate at different rates, right? And so, and we know that these intergenerational differences, because you're always gonna have some generational differences due, uh, due to being parents and kids of different ages are going to be compounded by acculturation differences as kids acculturate faster. And these are going to potentially increase conflicts in the family. So, as, so when I see this happening in a family, if I can speak smartly about how this happens, right? That it's not, a, it's not a kid trying to reject a parent and their culture. It's a normal, normal, quote unquote, right? Normative, commonly seen, right? Dynamic in a family that's recent immigrants. And so now we can talk about it. How can we get around that, right? How, how can we have a dialogue about the pros and cons of each of the cultures without having a personal blame, right, to the kids for changing faster. Here's another thing that we saw in our research and that again, if we want to improve family relationships, we need to understand that when parents and kids have separated, right, during the immigration process, how can it not, right, impact the family uh, relationship? And so, you know, we've done our own research uh, on it, but Suarez Orozco uh, has also done some very nice work. Uh, they have a very nice book that I have on my shelf here somewhere uh, that, it's, that talks really smartly about this, right? And so here's what we found in our own research, that many of the families who had separations uh, were separated for almost four years, right? that it happened around the age of seven years of age. Um, and, and just think about what that does, right? When a seven-year-old separates from a parent, right? From a primary parent, they're not reconnected again until 11 or 12, a lot of missed time, right? And so in this article that we wrote, we tried to articulate what are some of the things that we see, right? Ch uh, children's feelings of abandonment, 
guilt for about having those feelings. Um, um, the, the, the conflict that may be having these strong negative feelings is disrespectful, right? And we're ungrateful as a child for having these feelings. Um, how do I feel about the fact that my mom now has a new relationship and maybe new kids, right? That whole piece of the loyalty. And then parents, you know, they haven't really parented this child since they were seven. And now they're trying to catch up and maybe their parenting is age inappropriate. Yeah. So these are all just things that are not uncommon when you have a separation of four or five, six years. And this led us to develop psychoeducational modules that allow us to have a, a, a structured conversation with families about this, okay? And by the way, my colleague, uh, Maite Mena, was able to show that, especially for females, uh, more than for males, the length of the separation was directly related to the level of depression in the, in the, in the young ladies that came to treatment with us. And so it, said, it meant that there was a very clear relationship, right? Of the length of separation of all the issues that I just showed you going on behind the scenes that we as family therapists, if we can identify it and address it, we could be very successful, not only in reducing the depression, but in strengthening the family relationship. As you'll see in a minute, the, the issue is not only knowing that this is happening, right, in some of our families, but what do we do about it, right? And so as you'll see in our, our, our SIFTA therapy, many of these issues are addressed in psychoeducational modules. So that the minute that you see, oh, I have a family where this separation happened, the therapist can go, can go and grab the psychoeducational module that addresses this, and has a very structured way, right, to have this conversation and to work it through in the family. I know that there was some interest in the uh, research evidence behind the, uh, the work. Sometimes this puts people to sleep and sometimes it's uh, exciting. I'll try, to, I'll try to make it exciting. I don't know if that's possible. But <laughs> um, we have a lot of evidence uh, for uh, SIFTA. Um, the 2011 article was focused primarily on substance use. Uh, kids with all the kids that came in had substance use uh, issues. Um, the 2017 article uh, dealt with behavior problems in youth. This was a particularly interesting one because we actually created a hybrid in person and technology treatment. And this happened pre COVID. So, actually, it was very interesting because we were sort of ahead of the game uh, when it came time to provide virtual treatment. Um, and we had very good outcomes there. And then more recently, um, we just published an article in the Journal of Family Process. And it actually showed it was all, it was 200 Latino families. And we were actually able to show that the families that reported themselves to be less acculturated that is less Americanism per se, uh, actually did better with the treatment. They, they had the best outcomes. And so I think that the fit, right, between the cultural components and uh, where they were at as a family was very effective. So I just wanna show you a couple, a couple of slides on data. Um, I mentioned to you that family therapy is great, but you have to be able to engage reluctant family members, right? Here, here, is the, here is the secret about family therapy. The people that come easily into your office are probably not the family members that you really have to work with. <laughs> the one that's, a state, that's trying to stay at home and is reluctant to come in because they're angry, because they hate therapy, because they don't believe in it, they're the ones that could potentially undermine the success of your treatment. And so... There's real, real value in identifying those folks and using uh, specialized engagement interventions to bring them in to get to, 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 so that they give you a chance, right? And so this study was actually just about 
testing specialized engagement uh, interventions. And we could have a whole, you know, one or two hour workshop just on engagement and, and, what, it, and what it takes. But in this, in this study, we said, okay, half of the families are gonna get the engagement as usual, basically scheduling them, whoever comes in, comes in. This, this, these families were assigned to get a specialized engagement strategy. We were able to bring 81% of those families versus 60%. Right, so a lot more successful. And I left this in yellow to remind me that when we looked at the extra families that came in, they were those with the most severe symptomatology. So that, you know, families who would primarily be dropping out without specialized engagement, uh, the ones that wouldn't be coming in to get the family therapy were actually the ones that most needed, yeah? So we have actually like three articles that we've published just on engagement. And it's a, it's a major part of our training, right? To, for the therapist to practice understanding who is the reluctant family member, what's happening behind the scenes and how can I intervene in it? Okay, so this, this study was the one with substance using kids, right? Funded by the National Institute of Drug Abuse. And here we compared SIFTA to a traditional family therapy. And this was on the substance use um, measure, right? So what we saw was that in the traditional family therapy, there was a slight increase from pre-therapy to post-therapy. Not significantly worse, but somewhat of a decrease, of an increase in drug use. Uh, in SIFTA, we saw a pretty dramatic decrease. So something was happening there in the way that we were addressing substance use through the family, but all through, also through the, um, so through the modules, right? The mod psychoeducational modules. And as you'll see, we also include in the individual work, motivational interview. And so there's a number of components that work together and gave us a good outcome. This is on the primary symptomatology, right? Of substance use. <clears throat> But of course, we're interested in family dynamics as well, right? And what, what we know is that sometimes parent involvement as, as kids are acting out and parents begin to become hopeless, angry, they begin to separate. So what we found in the, the traditional uh, therapy was that there wasn't a lot of change in family involvement, in parental involvement specifically. And in SIFTA, because we addressed it uniquely, we were able to see from pre-therapy to post-therapy a, pre a significant improvement, right, in parenting involvement. Now, the most important thing about this is that it wasn't the parents reporting parents are involved. It was the kids. The kids were saying, my parents are more involved now after the therapy. And that was, we think, what led to the improvement, one of the things that led to the improvement in substance use. We always get we always get uh, sort of uh, qualitative, you know, reports from families because this uh, augments our data, and you know, it always it always gets to us when we hear families talking and saying things like, you know, mother saying, "Before I knew it, my daughter was saying, Mommy, you know that," and it's, uh, and she says, "My daughter hasn't said mommy since she was eight. So what does that tell us? It tells us that the relationship, right, is, has gotten stronger, closer, and the intimacy, right, it has returned in a way that, um, that wasn't there for a good while. And, and there are other sort of things that say, you know, a lot more communication, honesty about what's happening, et cetera. That wasn't too bad, right, in terms of data, I hope. <laughs> So, so we have, you know, we have data on, on, on behavior problems in Latino youth. Uh, we have data on substance use. We have data uh, on general sort of uh, comorbid, right, uh, behavior problems. And right now we're about to finish one on self-harm in youth. And again, working at the individual and the family level with self-harm. 
And one of the things that, that uh, became clear to us in the self-harm work is that there were lots of LGBT youth, right? Their rates of self-harm were pretty much off the charts, uh, as well as substance use. And that interaction, right, uh, is, a, is a major one because substance use potentiates, right, self-harm. And the importance of working with the family with LGBTQ youth was very important because you remember I said one size does not fit all. So, you know, one can get an adaptation of a therapy for LGBTQ youth, but uh, not all LGBTQ youth are the same and their families are not the same. And so what you do as a therapist with a family that's accepting is very different from a family that's rejecting, right? And one maybe that's rejecting because they're very traditional, right? And, and so the way you work with it is different. And so uh, that's, you know, that's what we're trying to uh, show in our research now, and hopefully to be able to articulate the therapist uh, as we move forward. All right, so, so I wanna get into the nuts and bolts a little bit of SIFTA. Um, I have these wheels and arrows because I do believe that these are not individual separate components. The strength of SIFTA is when this can work together, right? Um, not as a standalone, but here, is, here are some of the things that we work with. Motivation enhancement, when we're working with the individual adolescent. Things like emotion regulation. We've actually integrated some of Marsha Linehan's DBT skills because we think they're so important, right? Things like um, uh, interpersonal effectiveness, emotion regulation, uh, mindfulness, right? And so we find that very, very helpful. Psychoeducational modules, and we're up to about 22 at this point, are the place, are one, are one of the places where the therapist can say, okay, I see the family in front of me. These are the riskiest things that are, that are going on. Let me look at the menu of psychoeducational modules and pick the ones that fit best, yeah? Uh, if there's a separation, we have a separations module. If there's a culturation conflict, we could pick that. If there's emotion regulation issues in the youth, we could pick that. So, so we have modules on parenting, on a number of other things. So we have modules for kids and for parents, right? And it's, again, it's the place where we do the most tailoring. And I'll show you that in a second. And then we have our family therapy, uh, reducing conflict, increasing support, improving parenting, et cetera. The reason that this has to work together is because we might be working on interpersonal effectiveness with the youth, right? In individual therapy. And then they show up in family therapy and they start expressing their needs. Well, the parents may not be used to that and they might fight against it, but we as family therapists say, oh, hold on one second. Did you appreciate that your kid has learned these new interpersonal effectiveness skills and communicating needs? Let's work through as a family to see how we integrate that. And all of a sudden, if we sh can shape the family, they can actually reinforce the kid's changes versus work against them. I hope that makes sense, but that's why that's why all of this has to work together. And that's why when the therapist is working on something with the kids, we are prepared when the family therapy session comes to continue to work on that topic in a family context. This is a profile that we create to help the therapist use uh, the profile of the family, whatever the high points are, for example, here we're saying, you know, there's a big difference on Americanism between kids and parents. Well, because that's a high point, that might be something that we want to address in therapy. Yeah. And so we'll pick a module that can, that can address that. So we try to help the therapist see, okay, from the data that the family is given, you might want to consider a module on LGBTQ youth. We might want to consider a module on interpersonal effectiveness. We might want to consider something on acculturation, right? Because these are the points that the, that is unique to this family, yeah? 
So, so this process is the tailoring process, yeah, that, that can allow the therapy to be uh, uniquely tailored to uh, the intervention. Okay, I have uh, about uh, 19 minutes. I don't know if there are any questions. Uh, maybe I can look at the chat and see. Curious, no, it's the same clinician provide. Great question, uh, Maria. I'm curious to know if the same clinician provides family and individual adolescent sessions. Uh, answer is yes. Marsha Linehan separates them. She says that the DBT therapist is different from the skills therapist. Um, there's good reason for that. Be and that is because the, when you have a therapist, it's hard for a therapist to be very didactic in terms of skills. They, own, they, 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 they drift into therapy. And, and so that's a, sort of a, a, a complication. We believe that the therapist needs to be the same one because we, you, you have too many things fall through the cracks when you have multiple therapists. And, and again, if you remember the wheels, we want to make sure that if you're working on something in an individual session, that you're help, helping the generalization of that in the family work and vice versa, right? When, <clears throat> when the kids are blowing up in front of the parents and being disrespectful and uh, losing, losing it, we want to go back to our individual session and say, huh, you know, talk about what happened yesterday at the family therapy session. Are there any of the skills that you could have used to be more effective with your parents? Because the blowing up just doesn't work for you, right? And But I can do that now in individual, right? And then go back to the skill. And so that back and forth, we believe is really critical to making this work. Um, but it takes a certain discipline from the therapist. And, and we admit that. And we have to be even more careful with issues of confidentiality when we're working, right, with the family and the kids. So that means that that becomes a major point in our training and in our coaching. Yeah? Okay. At what age does adolescence start per this model? Hmm. We've been working with kids from 11 years of age. Actually, we moved down to 10 in our self-harm because we, you know, we realized that there were a bunch of 10-year-olds that were self-harming. And it was earlier than we were going to work, but we said we can't you know, turn away these kids just because of our criteria. So we started at 10, we go all the way up to 18. Now, of course, you know, uh, we're, talk we're talking in the field about emerging adults where a lot of the issues are going well into the 20s, right? Things that we used to consider more about as being adolescent. So that's a great question and it continues to be a point of dialogue. Okay, wonderful. I'm glad we got some of those out of the way. Um, hopefully I was able to address them to uh, some extent. So now that's the evidence-based intervention, right? Pretty good research. I think pretty good manual, pretty good uh, manual that allows tailoring. But to be really honest with you, in my work with agencies around the country, sustainability was a tough call. Really, really difficult. Um, with every, with not only with uh, family therapy, but with most evidence-based treatment. So why, why is that true? Here's some of the challenges that we've seen. One is that it's difficult to learn and feel confident using a new treatment. If you're trained in cognitive behavioral therapy, it's not that easy to jump into family work, you know, full force. Um, typically training occurs around a, a two or three day training workshop, right? That's what most of us go to, but that isn't sufficient. Uh, usually therapists leave that two or three day training and the minute they're in front of a family, they're like, okay, but how does this really work, right? What does it really look like for me to, in, to do this intervention? Here? Agencies typically have very high rates of staff turnover. And so an agency, uh, an organization can dedicate lots of money to bring an expert, you know, like me, for example, in family work or 
you know, uh, one of our partners, um, a Manorino on TFCBT or something on CBT, you know, you bring an expert out, they do this two or three day training. It's been my, my experience that sometimes three months down the road, they've lost 20, 30, 40% of those trained staff. So think about what that means to an agency and their budget, right? Now they have to start over again. They have to somehow bring the expert back. You can't do that three times a year, right? Who can afford that? And so despite the fact that the two or three day training is not ultimately the best answer, that's still what you're left with when you get turnover, yeah? So this turnover issue has been a, a, just a huge one. And then there are sometimes organizational factors, right? Organizational readiness factors that are important. So, so because of this literature that showed that even when you have an evidence-based treatment, um, by the way, you remember way back when, when we got a vaccine for uh, COVID? Getting the vaccine is one thing, but getting the infrastructure around the country to deliver it, right? And to get people thinking, I want the vaccine, that's a whole different story, right? That whole infrastructure of making it happen is a whole different story, right? And then you have to deal with vaccines going bad and getting wasted. And so the point is that having something that works is one thing, getting into people in a way that really works is a whole different story. So I mentioned this before, uh, having an evidence-based treatment is step one, but having an evidence-based training, coaching, and implementation, that's what I'm struggling with now. That's what we got funded with the NIMH to do. And we're actually having a lot of fun with it. Hopefully you'll like what you see in a second. So here's some of the, what we think are solutions, right? Um, it's having an on-demand online training platform, but we all know, right? Because we've taken online training before and we fall asleep <laughs> or we, you know, or we start thinking about everything but <laughs> whatever's there because they tend to be boring. They tend to be PowerPoint slides. They sometimes if we're lucky, they have a voiceover. But what we think, what we realized was important is to have an online training platform where the person was interacting, was interacting at all times, right? That provided the online ability to practice things, right? If I'm telling you that engagement practices are really important and that there are certain messages that you can give to engage a reluctant family member, why not create a platform where you can try them out with simulated, with simulated parents, right? Not waiting until you have a real difficult reluctant parent in front of you, but with a simulated parent and you can try different things out and our expert can give you feedback as to how it's working. So by the time you get to a real family, you feel much more confident, yeah? So that's the idea of this. Obviously it's done at the trainee's convenience, off hours, you know, this is another thing that agencies told us, you know, when you have a two or three day training, I have to shut down my agency to send therapists there and, you know, or I have to get replacements and we're losing a lot of money. So this online platform creates a lot of flexibility so that off hours can be used for these kinds of things. Um, and, you know, we, we look at what are the specific competencies that we wanna teach. Uh, some of them for us are thinking systemically, right? Systemic conceptualization, the cultural pieces, how does culture fit in here? Uh, how do I engage, right? How do I do motivational interviewing? And for each of those competencies, we have simulations where the trainee can practice, right? Their their practice their craft. And you know, after training, we have coaching. But by now, the coaching is much more precise because we know what you are good at as a trainee. We know what you what you're having more difficulty with, and you tell us. I want to work more on this thing. I have difficulty with this thing. And so our coaching can be much more precision and precise uh, and focused, right? Um, more, much more efficient, I think. By the way, because I, for, I think I forgot to say this, research is showing that when therapists try to learn a new intervention that from what they've done and they don't get coaching and support, 
that can actually increase staff turnover, stress and turnover. Imagine how bad that is for an agency, right? They've dedicated new monies to train you on something new, and it actually backfires. Not only does it not work well, but it may increase staff turnover. So the whole coaching and support piece is really important so that a team is there with you as you try something new, yeah? These are some of our trainers, our simulated trainers. They now feel they're superior to us, the, the human counterparts, but whatever, we're, we're dealing with that internally, that conflict between us. <laughs> um, and so I'm gonna try to show you if, I, if it runs, a simulation between a mother and a daughter uh, having an argument, and this is what a therapist would see, a trainee would see, and then we ask them, okay, what would you say, well, how, where would you stop this, how would you do that, and what would you say to this family to move them in the right direction, yeah? So this is basically, let me see if this will start. Actually, let me see if I can have it all right. Yeah, there they are. Can you see the image? Yes? And yeah, hopefully, yeah. hopefully you will hear it as well. So this is an example of what, when we're teaching, you know, handling conflict. By the way, family therapy can be very effective, but one of the hardest parts is to know what to do with conflict, right? Because if you don't handle it well, the family can get worse because you've just allowed hurtful interactions to happen in front of you. And if you don't handle it right, the family may leave and say, well, I'm hopeless now, because even in front of the therapist, things got worse, right? So, so we feel here's a competency that you need to learn. Identifying how the argument's happening, where I can block it, and how to do that respectfully, right? Because blocking is easy. Okay, you know, can you can you be quiet while I work with? But to do that respectfully is a different story, right? For me to say, oh, Dad, uh, maybe you and I can sit back for a minute and let daughter and mom work on this. That's more respectful, right? Uh, more likely to be okay for me to do that block. Okay, so I'm going to show you. This is what a therapist would see during this competency training, and then. Um, we would ask them with their camera to record what they would say to the family. And then I see, see what they said and I respond, I give them feedback. Oh, this is great that you said this. How about you could have tried this? You know, That's the feedback they get right on their own recording. So they know exactly what I'm referring to. Yeah. How are things this week? Cynthia took the car keys in the middle of the night and took our car for a ride with friends. What is the big deal? I was sick of our fighting, and I needed some space. You don't even have a license. Dad, do you think this is such a big deal? I have driven with you before. Don't ask me. I give up. Very typical of him. Typical of you to attack Dad. I wish you would stop. So how did that feel watching that? <laughs> Could you Been feel there. Been there. Yeah. So if I told you, it's one thing to watch it, but if I told you this is your family, you have to come up with something you have to say right now, all of a sudden you feel a little more anxiety, right? And that's good. I want you to feel the anxiety with the simulation and not with the real family. When I learned family therapy, I had to do it with a real family and there was an expert behind the one-way mirror calling me and saying, that's not right. <laughs> so, so, I think, so I think experiencing this here and practicing, right? Where did that interaction go wrong? By the way, where one of the places that you stop it is where the daughter tried to pull in father, because that's a deviation of the conversation, a triangulation. So I would teach the therapist, okay, you need to block there. How would you say that respectfully, right? To block. And how would you keep mother and daughter on that on that negotiation that they were doing? Because it was a it was a really reasonable piece to talk about. So that's what it looks like. And, and I, as an expert, would give the trainee feedback. Um, I think I better stop there. I think I got through everything that I wanted to share.
Um, I don't know if there are any, let me see if there are any questions or, or Barbara, is there a different way that you want to have people unmute and have uh, discussions, et cetera? I would love that. Um, Bianca, would you mind um, articulating, I'm putting you on the spot, articulating your question because I think it's a really lovely one and I don't want to take credit for it. So go for oh it. Oh my gosh. Um, hello everyone. My name is Bianca Vinian. I'm a fourth year medical student in Texas, currently applying to psychiatry, hopefully the very passionate about child psychiatry, so I know I'm going to be a child psychiatrist. Um, I'm attending this because I do a lot of community-based research in Texas, and um, I work closely with our Family Service Center. We're always talking about our patient population being a minority Black population, um, but having non-minority therapists. And um, we know, again, like you said, evidence-based family therapy works, especially with, um, I say, uh, Black patients. However, when I was looking at your training, how do you train cultural humility? Because there's an obvious discomfort as, uh, when you have therapists um, engaging with Black families and they're fighting, right? And it's so say, let's just being honest, white therapists, Black mom, Black daughter fighting, the same situation, like you weren't gonna pick me up. I need yeah. to go do my hair, I have to the keys. What are we doing here? And then there's obvious discomfort because it's what, what, what do we do? So we talked about, I know you talked about engagement and that's very important. I'm very, I'm, I appreciate you saying that because you need to take time to engage in the, you know, the community. Yeah. However, how do you test cultural humility? How do you test all that with um, your specific training? You know, like um, yeah. it's not the same, like, how do you, be, because we can't wait for more black therapists, right? Unfortunately, like, you know, I can talk to the NIH and say like, hey, please, we need to send us a lot of money. Um, but our students and our families need help now. Bianca, thank you so much for that question. That is the key question, right? Um, the research says that when therapists and clients are matched on race and ethnicity, things go typically more smoothly. Outcomes are great uh, or better. We can't wait for that, right? And especially in different parts of the country, there's more or less chance of matching people. Uh, so we need to have therapists that are comfortable having that conversation. And there are, there are, there's great material out there on how do I bring up the topic? How do I, how do I bring up the topic that how does it feel working with me? I'm I'm different on many dimensions, right? I'm uh, Latino, I'm not black, I'm uh, young, whatever, whatever that topic is. But the, the key is that the therapist has to know the, know the material, but also practice so that they're comfortable. If you're not comfortable bringing up the topic, then you are already, lo you already lost probably you know, one of the battles. Yeah? Uh, so for example, I have some animations about kids saying, you know, I got thrown out of school because, and it's a totally racist. It was a totally racist incident. Now, you know that some therapists who are uncomfortable talking about racism will just shut down and go to something else. So we're trying to teach therapists not only to be prepared to answer that question, but to practice so that they're comfortable, right? And I'll see the recording of what they say, and I might say, you know, you avoided this topic, or you avoided that. You know, you avoided that because there's a whole myth out there that some of these men are really aggressive and angry. Right. You know, you know that some therapists will see our populations and say, well, men are aggressive and angry. And so I don't really want to even let them argue because that's scary. So if you don't get past that, right, if you don't get past that, you can't do family therapy. So we have to teach. And, and again, see, um, this is a beautiful question because we know that conflict in families happens and that we have to change it. But now what your question is, how do you how does race meld into that? Right? How do therapists become even less effective at handling conflict because they're not comfortable, right? They're not, they're not humble asking questions, knowing, knowing what they don't know and what they need to learn, right? And what and what doors they have to open for the client to be able to say, yeah, I'm concerned about the fact that you and I are so different. The therapist has to practice those things. So we think that our setting is the one that we have to help them practice those things. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you so much. And, and, the, and 
and, and there are so many dimensions across the board, like what you were just mentioning, right? We work in the juvenile justice system and you know, black youth uh, uh, to, to the most extent, but also Latinos might get referred to the juvenile justice system prematurely for behaviors that others won't. We need to know that. And we need to be able to open that door and say, how do you feel about the fact that you were referred and to, and to, and to listen knowingly that they may feel that they were discriminated against by being referred prematurely for juvenile justice, yeah? So anyway, I can go on, but I'm sorry, I'm passing. I wish you could, I wish we all had the time. Um, I just wanna be respectful of other people's time as some people are dropping off for, you know, for good reasons, I totally understand. Um, I am happy to stay on for five more minutes. Um, Dr. Santi Esteban, is, do you have five more minutes? Absolutely, I can stay on. Okay. So folks, if you have five more minutes, stay on. I'm happy to continue being host. Ethan, if you can't hang around, totally, totally get it. <laughs> All right. So I, you know, I think the psychoeducation piece um, somewhat res uh, um, uh, responds to this question that Bianca so astutely articulated, like the, 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 the complexity of it. We're often led to our own devices and to our own feelings about how to talk about race and racism and oppressive practices. And Meanwhile, we have therapies that give us all sorts of instruction on how to talk about emotion regulation and interpersonal effectiveness. And I think what you know, what SIFTA brings that's new that you've been doing for a long time, but is relatively new in comparison to other um, package treatments is it's built in. That's a psychoeducational model, acculturation, immigration experience, right? And I and and I wonder if there is a a, a piece there where it's like more formalized module on racism and its impact, right? Which is tied to immigration and acculturation, but not quite the same. I wonder if you could speak to that piece of like a modular, psychoeducational modular approach like you have already. Um, yeah. so, we, so, we have, so we have modules that are um, existing, but that we're still strengthening as we go, dealing with discrimination, racism, um, uh, anti-immigrant um, sentiment, right? And, and it's, it's true for the kids. We can work on it with the kids individually, but then we also want to work on the family, right? How does the family validate what the kid's going through and buffer, right? All those conversations that we know about, for example, parents talking to kids about how to work with the police when they get stopped, right? That's, that's a parenting, that's a triggering an enhancement of parenting buffering effects because kids are out there in a risky place and we know what's going to happen right and so again that we have modules on that so that so that's where you know this protective issue comes in but i want to get back to the point that therapists have to practice these things to be comfortable when they get in, in front of a therapist um i'm blanking on his name now he wrote about racism and and there's another person who wrote on um, from a feminist family therapy perspective and both said the same thing it's one thing to understand the concepts and to buy it i buy this you know i have to fight racism it's not just you know sort of accept i have to actually actively but how to how to transfer that from your mind out your mouth <laughs> right in in a way that works to a therapist that's a whole other set of steps and we cannot just conceptually convince people that these things are important. We have to help them, you know, transfer it into their practice. Yeah. And that's where, and that's where I think that the that the new generation of work is is moving. Laura Gonzalez, go ahead and you'll be our last person before we we end today. Hi, thank you so much. Um I'm very curious, I think probably more so as a Latina therapist, how to be culturally respectful when dynamics are very cultural to the family. In this case, I'm specifically thinking of like machismo, where it can be a very cultural thing in the family. Yeah. And it's also harmful to the family. And that yeah. upholding that culture also brings harm. Like, how do we manage that when I'm not there to educate and it is harming the family. Great, great question. Absolutely a great question. 
um, it's a, and I, I don't, I don't know how to say it better than it's a balancing act. We, if we, if we go in with our judgment, and I try to teach these this to all of our therapists, if we go in with the judgment, and we're going to have it, right? I'm going to have my judgment about, you know, uh, strong power differentials in couples, right? Like really dramatic ones, machismo. Um, rituals that include a lot of substance use, right? And they say, well, that's cultural, right? Um, I'm going to come in with my judgment, but if I impose that prematurely, I will just lose the family, right? And it's not fair for me to do that because the family has a right to have their set of values. And so how you meet the family where they're at first, right? Without too much judgment, and then slowly move to show them where things are working and not working in their family, right? For them to, to, to promote them seeing themselves, right? Where the machismo is getting in the way of a successful family with where well-being of each of its members is moving forward, right? So you promote that piece with the well-being of each family member is moving forward. And I know you, dad, that's one of your big things. You want the well-being of this family. Well, let's talk about what's working and not working there. Yeah. And so, so slowly we can go into not machismo is bad, right? But in what ways are some of the behaviors that are happening interfering with the well-being of family? Does that make sense? It's a very delicate, it's a very delicate act because. My preference sometimes is to go full force and say, you know, that's not working, guys, <laughs> you know, but then I'm imposing my perspective and my view, right, as a therapist on a family, and they have a right to have their set of values, but, but they're coming to me so I can help them tweak, right, tweak and tweak, and ultimately, you could tweak a lot, you know, <laughs> Uh, and they might change a lot, but if it, but they have to sense that they have to sense themselves that they have to do some work on them. Does that make sense? That's the that's the art that goes with the science. <laughs> this is so great. It's so great visiting with you, even with each of you, even though we're in separate spaces. Um, it was it was very warm um, and um, very rich experience today. So thank you. Everyone have a great day and thank you so much for this talk and for taking the time and I can't wait to learn more. Thank you all for the great work that you do. <laughs> Take care everyone.